Today's lesson is the fall of man. That doesn't sound real encouraging, but I want you to hold on because we have to get through this part in order to understand thoroughly what the salvation of man is all about. Let's take a look at the scripture. If man did fall, from where did he fall? You can go all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 1, and verse 26 gives us a brief but very succinct synopsis of just what we're talking about. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, verse 27, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So in the beginning, we were created in the image and the likeness of God. What a lofty position that was. It really is. As you think about how God created Adam and Eve in the beginning. Now, we'll get to the point that God had a plan and provided a way for us to be restored. So don't lose hope. But let's talk about that very negative thing that happened and that required salvation to come into play. Whenever you think about how God created us, let me go on to say in the Psalms, we find in Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8, just how significant this position was that God placed man when he created him. Of course, we're talking about Adam and Eve, male and female, when we say him. The scripture says there in Psalms 8, beginning at the fourth verse, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to be, have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and yes, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and what whosoever or whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. And when you look in your Bibles, if you have a reference Bible, you'll notice there that there's a note concerning made him a little lower than the angels. The word there in the Hebrew is Elohim, which is also the word for God. And so what it's saying to us is this was an incredibly high position in which God created man to exist in, to have dominion, to have authority, and to be in relationship in a way with God that no other created thing could enjoy. And so it was a very terrible thing whenever man lost that position. You say, well, how did that come about? All you have to do is turn to Genesis chapter 3, and you begin to see exactly what transpired that caused the fall of man. Now when we say the fall of man, what we're talking about is a separation from God. And here's how it began. In Genesis chapter 3, in the first verse, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? It was that question, the, the seed of doubt that was placed into the woman's mind that led to the sinful act that caused the separation which we call the fall of man. Here Satan, the devil, used the serpent, the form of a serpent, and came and began to speak with Eve. Now this must have been a, an animal, a creature, a reptile, so to speak, in the garden that uh, had great beauty as everything did. But somehow the enemy cunningly used this creature as a means of speaking to Eve and convincing her to question really what God had said. And so it was very, with very smooth words, with enticing words, that he cunningly caused her to begin to doubt and to think that somehow God had a motive that was not in their best interest. Now this is one of the tricks of the enemy that's used even today. To get people to believe that God has a motive toward them that's not in their best interest. And of course we know 
scriptures like Jeremiah 29 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of good, not of evil, to give to you a future and a hope. What a lie and what a deceitful act on the part of the serpent to get Eve to believe that somehow God was keeping she and Adam from a position that would make them equal with God. Well, first of all, how ludicrous was it for them to even begin to think that they could be on the same level as the Creator? But wasn't that, in fact, the very same deception that caused Lucifer to be cast out of heaven in the first place? He had a desire to be like God. And so he perpetrated that same line of thinking into the heart and mind of Eve, who then persuaded Adam to do the same thing. And so here in verse 6 we read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband and with her, and he ate. And so, you know, a lot of times we, we men like to put the blame on the women uh, as causing us to fall. But as you read through the scripture, you discover that the assignment of that fall, that first Adam that failed, that assignment goes to the man. Because I believe that God had created in such a way, had Adam cried out for mercy, I believe it could have been turned around right then and there. But as it were, and as we read in the scriptures, there came a separation. It opened the floodgates of sin because that deception and that doubt led to disobedience because God had instructed them that they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The enemy, the serpent, had convinced them that God had motives that didn't have their best interest in mind, that he was somehow keeping something from them. Again, this is one of the age-old tricks of the enemy, and this is how it led to the separation that came. It was a terrible thing, and all the qualities that God had created within mankind were then to be distorted. They were to become perverted and evil in their intent because now sin had entered into the world. What was pure and free from sin, pristine in nature, was now contaminated. And the world became contaminated with this evil thing that we know as sin. And so it's a very terrible thing. So instead of loving holiness, unregenerate man has a vicious bent towards sin and evil. And so now what used to be a desire to avoid evil and wickedness, now there's a desire for it. There's a hunger for that. And it required God to come in and do something that we'll talk about more in another lesson, but for our purposes here to understand it required him to cause a whole transformation to take place. The effect of sin in the fall infiltrated all of humanity. All of humanity. That's why the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because the father and mother of all humanity in Adam and Eve contaminated, the seed was contaminated by sin, and it's been perpetrated on all of, uh, all of humanity ever since. And so for there to be a transformation, God says, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. What is that old? The old is the, the degenerate, depraved part of humanity that has a bent toward sin. The new, the transformed person, is the one who has a desire for holiness, has a desire for the things of God. And so this is a powerful word to help us understand just how serious the depravity was that it entered into the hearts of both man and woman and everyone that would come. From that point forward, every child born would be born, sure, there's an innocence about that child, but at the earliest opportunity, they would display a bent toward sin. 
And you see that even to this day. You know, there's things that children will do if they're instructed not to do it, if, it, if they have an interest and a desire, and it requires training and instruction in the Word of God. And then, of course, when they become of age, to make spiritual decisions about their life and eternity, they have to receive Christ themselves. And so the scripture tells us how they were given over to a reprobate mind. I want to read from Romans chapter 1, beginning at the 21st verse. In fact, I'll read verses 21 and 22. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. I'm going to read a few passages from Romans at this point. Romans chapter 1 beginning at the 21st verse, it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This was the effect of the fall. This was the effect of the separation that took place. You'll remember after Adam and Eve sinned, they became aware of their nakedness. The glory of the Lord had lifted. The glory is not going to exist in a sinful environment and in a place of disobedience. And so as the glory lifted, they became aware of their nakedness. And because of that, they felt ashamed. They didn't have to feel ashamed before when the glory was present, but when it departed, they felt ashamed. And so they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, the scripture says. And, and so when God came to walk with them and talk with them, which is the beauty of relationship with God, is that he will spend time with us as we spend time with him. When he came to do what was customary in their relationship, because of the brokenness that occurred, they hid from God. Now, obviously, God was mindful of their location and called out to them, but it's a real picture of separation that happens because of the shame of sin and what happens when a person is disobedient and away from God. Vain imaginations, a foolish heart darkened by sin. As you read on down a little further in the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning at the 28th verse, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, unmerciful. In other words, all these characteristics of a depraved life, a life away from God in broken relationship with God because of the fall. And as time progressed, the perversion of thought became such that the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It really sounds like a contemporary verse to what we're seeing happen right now in the earth. We live among people who are calling evil good and good evil. So the fall of man is still very prevalent today. And it's something that we must be aware of so that we can then get to the solution. The scripture shows us in Romans chapter 3, starting at the ninth verse, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin as it is written. In other words, the gospel that we preach is not to suggest that this group or that is bad, that this person or that person is worse than another, because everyone, everyone is in that same condition outside of Christ. And it goes to say that they are all under sin as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together, they have together become unprofitable. There is none that do, does good, 
No, not one. And it, it goes on. You can continue to read on down through verse 18. But here's what it says in verse 19 of that same chapter, Romans chapter 3. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. You know, before a person can really be transformed, they have to come to the realization that they are in sin, that they are separated from God. And that's, that's the first step in the battle, is for people to understand that there is a need for salvation in their life. And the fall of man is what's caused that great need in all of our lives. Jesus, he's the solution to the fall. The fall of man, and the way that he is the solution is he became our redeemer. He was willing to become the sacrificial lamb to pay the price for us. And one of the ways that he qualified and became the lamb that could pay the price for our sin was whenever he was tempted in all ways as we are. Jot this scripture down in Matthew chapter 4, and you can read it later because it's a lengthy passage and we won't take time right now to read all of it. But Matthew chapter 4, beginning in the first verse, is the story of the temptation of Jesus. You know how after he was baptized, he was, he was led by the Spirit of God, driven by the Spirit of God to go out into the wilderness and there fast and pray. And it was a 40-day fast that he was on. And during that time, there were three major temptations that he went through. And each time, Jesus resisted that temptation by saying, It is written. And then he quoted the Word of God. What we discover from that is that Jesus was tempted in all ways, all points, as we are. In that way, he can be the sacrificial lamb for you and for me. The book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and verse 15, says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So in other words, he distinguishes himself in that he's experienced the temptations that we have. You may say, well, I don't see all of my temptations in Matthew chapter 4. Well, the truth is, is that when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, as our Redeemer, all of our sins and temptations were laid upon him. You'll remember Jesus did live on earth to approximately the age of 33 years. And so you can be assured that there were numerous temptations that he faced down over the course of his 33 years in life. But anything that was missed happened on the cross. And that's why the writer of Hebrews can say to us, the high priest that we have is not someone who has avoided, missed out on, or doesn't understand the temptations of my life. No, quite the contrary. He's been tempted in every single way in which I've been tempted, and yet he was without sin. What an incredible miracle it was for Jesus to live a sinless life for you and for me. You say, well, Kevin, you've painted uh, a pretty dim picture of what sin is and how great sin is and the vast amount of sin. And, and listen, I've not even taken time to tell you the things that are obvious to you. If you live in society, you understand that sin abounds. It is abundant everywhere you turn. But the good news is, is that is nothing new to God. It doesn't catch him off guard. In fact, the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Aren't you thankful that all the shame, uh, all the disgrace, and everything that comes with sin can be taken in 
by the precious grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that he offers to us to redeem us. The first step in being redeemed, though, is to recognize that we have been separated from God. As I bring this lesson to a close, I want to say this. There's nothing worse than separation from God. Some people even today around us don't understand that they're separated from God. They think they're doing pretty good because they've been a good person. But did you know even a good person can be separated from God? What is it to be separated from God? We know God is everywhere. God knows all things. But you see, sin is like a great gulf and a divide. And if a person has continued to live in sin and has not accepted the rem remedy that, that God offers through his son Jesus for, him, for us to receive him through the grace that he pours out to us and to accept him by faith, then there's a separation. And the first prayer that has to be prayed is a prayer of repentance, recognizing the sin, and acceptance of the free gift that he's offered. And if a person will do that, the great gulf and divide that exists because of sin becomes bridged by the cross of Jesus. We're going to talk more about that in our lesson on the salvation of man. But the fall of man reminds us of the urgency that we all have to share the gospel and the good news. There are people, as I said, that don't realize they're on a ship that is sinking. And we must sound the alarm to let them know that they're in danger. And that in itself is the love of God reaching out. So again, the fall of man is a serious state of being that all humanity has to face. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter what a person's estate in life, what their socioeconomic status is, their level of education, none of that matters in regard to their situation in sin. And that's why it's so important that we share the good news. This lesson is a lesson on the salvation of man. Now, you talk about good news. We've got something good to talk about today. If you look in theological studies, you find the word soteriology. Soteriology is uh, a part of systematic theology that focuses strictly on salvation, the great word salvation and all of its implications. There's tremendous volumes that have been written on this subject. Of course, for today, we're only going to take a few moments to highlight some of the key aspects of the salvation that we discover through the scriptures. But please know there's a lot more to investigate regarding salvation than what we'll have time to cover today. Many of you are probably familiar with a Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. C.I. Schofield was a theologian, and, and he took the King James Bible and com made companion notes with that and then published it. And uh, it's been known and recognized as a great study Bible for many, many decades. I want to share this from his references on Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. That particular verse, you know, is the verse that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This was the writing of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Schofield makes this note, and I think this really helps us along in our study of salvation today. He said, the Hebrew and Greek words for salvation imply the ideas of deliverance, safety, preservation, healing, and soundness. Salvation is the great inclusive word of the gospel, gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes as justification, redemption, grace, propitiation, imputation, forgiveness, sanctification, and glorification. Now that was a mouthful, wasn't it? 
I hope that you'll take the time maybe to reflect, and if you have a Schofield Bible, you may want to look that up for yourself. But get that and think about it. I actually would not really need to go any further today, although I'm going to, uh, if we took the time to really piece by piece take apart that statement that he made regarding Romans 1.16. But I want to share a few points with you concerning salvation, and in particular the conditions of salvation. We've already looked at the fall of man, and we know there's a desperate need for salvation to come, for relationship to be restored, for the gulf uh, to be covered so that we can make passage uh, into relationship with God. First of all, I want to talk about salvation comes from God. P.C. Nelson made the statement, it was thought by God, the Father, bought by God the Son, and wrought by the Holy Spirit. And man had no part in planning it or purchasing it. His part is to accept it as a gift from God. He's talking there about salvation. In other words, God thought up salvation. Jesus made it possible, and the Holy Spirit ministers it to us so that we can receive it. Luke 19.10 says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you read on in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That separation that occurred, remember it was addressed in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God wasn't caught off guard. He had a plan, and he spoke of Jesus. It's actually the first reference to Jesus the Redeemer. When he speaks there and he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, the cross and the resurrection crushed the head of Satan. Yes, he bruised the heel of Jesus through his suffering there at Calvary, but had the devil known what was coming, I don't believe he would have fulfilled his design there at Calvary because he played into the hand of God for redemption to be purchased for you and for me. The second point I want to share with you is salvation is through Christ alone. Through Christ alone. Peter said this in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. It is his name that makes a way for us. Listen to a few of these scriptures, and I'll just call them out and read them quickly. I've got them printed out right here. Matthew 20:28 20, says, He came to give his life as a ransom for many. 1 John 2:2, 2, 2, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you go down to Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. It is impossible to separate Christ from our salvation. Our salvation comes through Christ alone. And it's important for us to remember that. He was the one who shed His blood. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Aren't you thankful that he was willing to shed his blood for you and for me? I know I am. We serve a wonderful Savior. The third thing I want to share with you is, it is a work of grace received by faith. You know, it wouldn't do us a whole lot of good if we knew that he had offered this gift but we didn't know how to collect it. We didn't know how to receive it into our own life. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, shows us the way. It says, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Faith becomes the vehicle. It's a spiritual vehicle that enables us to receive the gift that's been offered to us. And it's not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Now this statement, not by works so that no one can boast, is incredibly important when we talk about salvation. The fact of the matter is there are billions, I can say that, billions of people on the earth today that are attempting to earn their way to heaven. And even if it's not the heaven that we know that's recorded in the scripture to meet the God that we love, they're still desiring and working and trying to attain to a paradise, to a goal, to a place of bliss that they can enjoy after this life on earth. And all their struggling is in vain. It's useless. It's of no value for eternity. It might help them to feel good and maybe help someone else feel good while they're walking in this life. But it is not going to help them get to heaven. It is by the grace of God, not by our works. In other, in other words, no one is going to stand in heaven and stand before God and say, God, you should let me into heaven because I'm a good person. I've done a lot of good things. I've given a lot of money to the church and to charities. I've helped to feed the hungry. All of which are great things. They're good things to do. But did you know good things won't get you to heaven? It's the grace things received by faith. It's not by the work that we do. It's by the work that he did that we enjoy the salvation that we have. It's holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, by grace, and that grace is holy, H-O-L-Y. It's something from God, given to us, offered freely. And so no one, it says in Romans 3, 19 and 20, therefore no one will be declared righteousness in his sight by observing the law. And in fact, the great reformation, when the 95 Theses was, was nailed to the Wittenberg door by Martin Luther, the whole purpose of that was a revolt, that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. It's not about works and all these other means that people were coming up with to try to convey salvation. It's from Him and by His grace, and we receive it by faith. Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 says, For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal... It's not based in knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not to submit to God's righteousness. In other words, they were doing their own thing and thought if they did their own thing, that should be good enough for heaven. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, Another point about salvation that we need to keep in mind is that salvation is for the whole person. Salvation is for the whole person. Let me just say it like this. Salvation is for spirit, soul, and body. And we'll lay out some of the implications of that. First and foremost, of course, we receive the regeneration that comes in being made a new creation. That's a spiritual transformation. We don't look any different on the outside whenever we're born again other than maybe our countenance. You know, a lot of times people when they come to Christ and have that heart transformation, it shines through their face and their countenance. And where they were cast down before, now they're smiling and they're excited because they have a peace that they didn't know or understand. A peace that can only come from Christ. And it was because he took that. But you know, Salvation is to impact us in our bodies as well. Jesus took our sorrows. He carried our griefs. He was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and by his stripes we were healed. That was prophesied concerning Jesus and salvation in Isaiah 53, hundreds of years before Christ came and lived on the earth in human flesh. And it spoke of that combination that we often read about where there's salvation for our spirit man and there's the power of God to touch us in our physical body. God wants to work in all of who we are. He wants to work within us. The psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. And it goes on to talk about crowning with loving kindness, satisfying his mouth with good things, so his youth renewed like the eagles, and so on. 
And so it's important to understand that God wants the whole person. Now we realize that there's a temporary nature to this flesh until it's transformed, and that's all for another lesson. But please understand, it's not that you just get yourself saved, and I know for many of you watching this, this is how you will share and teach others. It's not just for them to get changed on the inside, but it's also that we live differently in our bodies, that we live according to God's plan and His will for our lives, and that we can expect God to work within us to heal and to deliver and to set free. It's not merely the forgiveness of our sins and justification before God's courts. He wants to work in us all in all, and so we can believe Him for that. The next point I want to share with you concerning salvation is that it is for the past, the present, and the future. Now I need you to follow me on this because I don't want any heresy to come out of this. I don't want this to be distorted or confused. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read verse 4, verse 5, and verse 8. It says, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. In other words, while we were still sinners, Christ made this way for us. It is by grace you have been saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, which we read earlier, and this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. So, in other words, when it talks about past, all of our past sins are covered in salvation. Salvation takes care of those things that have been a part of our life. So regardless of, of whether a person has had what we look upon as a great sin, which I'm going to share with you in a little bit what really a great sin is, but, you know, we classify sins, things that would serve a, or, or deserve a felony charge and things that are a uh, violation of marriage covenants and things that are uh, violent in nature. We, great sins, we call those and think of them. But the truth is, any of those things in the past, no matter how terrible, can be forgiven. They're a part of salvation and the effect of salvation on our past. But it's also something for our, future, our present, rather. Let me go to that next. First our past, then our present. So secondly, it says we are being saved from the habit, the power, and the dominion of sin. Salvation is for right now. It's for today. It's for us to be redeemed, set free from the, the power of sin and its dominion and its grip in our life. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And that's a truth that many need to get a hold of because even after they've given their hearts to Christ, often they struggle to be free from the dominion of that sin. Remember, when we studied about the fall, we talked about how we were created in the image and likeness of God. And there in Genesis 1.26, it says that God gave us dominion. Well, unfortunately, through the fall, what's happened is there have been a lot of areas in our life that we've surrendered and given dominion to someone else or something else over us. Salvation restores us and puts us back in rightful position in dominion so that those things no longer hold us in bondage, but instead we walk in liberty. So it's for our past and it's for our present. It's to give us victory right now to serve the Lord. But it's also for our future. Another way of saying this is that we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Now again, hear that very clearly because I don't want any confusion. We are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. So we're saved. Whenever we come to Christ, we are justified. In other words, if we were to die at that very moment, we would be with Jesus because the price had been paid, satisfied in the courts of heaven, and we would go to be with Him and have a home in heaven for all eternity. But as we walk in this life, the reality is we still have to deal with this flesh. We deal with sinful things in the world around us, and that's where we're being saved. When 
God's working in us. He's moving us from glory to glory, and He's taken to that place that we overcome in every way that He's made available to us. And then we will be saved, and I want to read it the way I have it here in the notes as well. The third thing is, is at His coming, Christ will change our corruptible bodies to be like His glorious body. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a salvation, or excuse me, a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. So there will come a day when all the, the attachment of sin will be broken off once and for all. We won't even be in a place where the dust of the world can be kicked up on us. We'll be transformed. This body will be transformed, and it will settle once and for all. This is what you could call full salvation. Uh, not only are we saved from our past sins and being saved as God's working in us, but we will fully and completely be saved for all of eternity because not a trace of the effects of sin will exist there. That's going to be a glorious time, isn't it? The next point I want to share with you is that salvation neglected. In other words, if a person willingly neglects salvation that is offered to all people, that is a dangerous thing. Salvation neglected is a dangerous thing. P.C. Nelson said it this way, the sin of sins. I told you a little while ago I was going to share with you what really is the great sin, and this is it. The sin of sins is unbelief and rejection of Christ. This is the sin which causes the wrath of God to abide upon a lost soul. Now, excuse me, I know that no one, especially in this modern society in which we live, no one wants to talk about God in terms of wrath and of judgment. But realize for God's, for, for the holy standard of God to be measured out, there has to be a balance between love and, and wrath, you know, kindness and judgment and all these things. And, and it would be wrong for us to ignore the fact that you cannot willingly just ignore and reject Christ and think that everything will be okay. It's simply not the case. This is the sin which causes the wrath of God to abide upon a lost soul. Unbelief, and this is the words of this theologian, unbelief makes God a liar. It is a gross sin even to neglect so great a salvation and this neglect pulls down on the head of the impenitent a punishment more terrible than death. In other words, it pulls down this punishment on the head of the one who is not willing to accept and receive the great gift that God has offered to us. Scripture says, and I'm not going to read the whole passage again, but in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, right in the middle it says, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Again, in Hebrews, only now in chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, it says, How much more sincerely, excuse me, how much more severely, I'll get it right, do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. A person is in real jeopardy, eternal jeopardy, whenever they do these kinds of things. So the great sin is the sin of unbelief in rejecting Christ. It's a dangerous thing. The next point I want to share with you is simply this. By faith in Christ, we obtain salvation. By faith in Christ, we obtain salvation. Faith, as the means to obtain salvation, is the most clearly brought out, or excuse me, it is most clearly brought out in John chapter 3, verses 15, 16, 
and then also in verse 36. And I'll highlight these for you. These are familiar passages probably to most. Everyone who believes, believes in him may have eternal life. And then this one you know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only or his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And so, how is it that we obtain this great salvation? By believing on him. Or in other words, by having faith. The scripture tells us in Romans 5 and verse 1, we have been justified through faith. We've already read from Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through faith. Now, let me just say, faith is, uh, the prerequisite to that faith is a repentant heart. A heart that's been convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit and acknowledges the great need for salvation, the desperation of that need in their life, and they call out to God and have a real sorrow and a remorse for the ways of sin and disobedience at whatever level that might be. When a child comes to the Lord at an early age, they've obviously not committed great and gross sins, but nonetheless, if they recognize and feel a conviction in their heart to receive Christ, I would encourage them to do so. The fullness of their understanding will become greater as they grow older. But nonetheless, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with their heart and they feel sorry for their sins, then they can repent. But there could also be someone who's been an alcoholic. There could be someone who's been very mean and ugly and hateful toward people or a murderer. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. Sexual perverts and others that can all come to Christ when they recognize the need to repent. And when a person repents then by faith they can receive. Here's a few examples. Repent and believe the good news. That was Jesus, uh, or excuse me, that was Mark speaking in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. In Romans 1, verse 5, obedience comes through faith. Believe and obey him. Romans 16, 26. And then from the book of Acts, chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you. 1 John 1, 7 sums it up very well. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus that purifies us from sin? We've talked quite a bit about the human factor, the things that are required of us and the effect of our lives as it plays out in salvation, but it has to be noted that salvation is a God thing. It's, it's really an act of God on His part to offer to us this great gift of salvation. It was something that He did. And you can see a few examples. John six forty four. No one can come to me, this is Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So in other words, when a person is drawn by the Father, they can receive Christ. And then it talks about the Holy Spirit convicts. And it says in uh, John 16, verse 8, When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. John 3, 3 and 7 says, The sinner is regenerated by the power of the Spirit, and is born again. How is he born? He is born of the Spirit. And so it's really a God thing. It's Godward reaching out to us for salvation, to make a way for us. No one can enter the kingdom of God, it says, unless he is born of water and the Spirit. In other words, it has to be done the way in which God has provided. But Second Peter 1.4 says, Escape the corruption in the world cause by evil desires. And how does that happen? When we are saved. 
Now, to close this lesson on salvation, let me mention one other thing that's important. And that is there should be evidence of our salvation. Now, you can't look into the spirit of man and see what that appears like. That's an invisible nature. It's part of an invisible world. But nonetheless, there's outward expressions of that. I mentioned earlier that when someone gets saved, a lot of times it shows on their face. Their countenance is different. Their eyes are brighter. They have a smile. There's just a whole difference in their, the, their whole look because that heaviness of sin and the weight of that corruption of the world has been lifted. But beyond that, the Scripture has a, a phrase called the joy of our salvation. In other words, there is a, a lifting of a burden from our soul. And we have a joy in serving the Lord and seeking Him. Scripture says in Psalm 51, 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. The repentant sinner may tell the story in terms of feeling. In other words, when someone comes to Christ, they may say, Well, I feel so much better but those feelings still have to rest on a solid faith that there is something substantial and unchanging that has happened through the promises of God's Word. Because it's all based in the Word. It's all based on faith. We're not saved by feelings, although feelings are good. and Some people will have those. But the real evidence of salvation is the life that we live. How we're changed, how we approach life. It's a learning process for many, but sometimes there is just drastic transformation that takes place. A uh, wonderful friend that I know was a terrible drug addict. He was addicted. His life was just wasting away, but he had an encounter with God, and God touched him, and instantaneously this incredible addictive habit that he had was broken off of his life and he served the Lord ever since. That was a drastic transformation that took place. On the other hand, some people come and they receive and they have to walk it out. And we're going to talk more about that in another lesson on sanctification. But just remember, it's by faith, not by feeling. But it will be evidenced through the life that is lived. Let me read this to you. When the sinner repents and believes and accepts Christ by faith, as his personal Savior, his spirit witnesses to his new experience of salvation through Christ, and the spirit, as a corrob oh, I don't know if I can say that word, as a corroborative witness, bears witness with his spirit that he is a child of God. That's P.C. Nelson again, sharing a, a summation of what happens. But you know what the bottom line is? Is that we can say, Abba, Father. And we recognize that in salvation, we come into relationship. That relationship broken at the fall in the garden is restored. And we can cry out, Abba, Father. Oh, this great salvation that we have, it, it truly is a wonderful gift from God. Church Growth International of the Americas is a vision of Dr. David Yonggi Cho and Dr. Bob Rogers to reach out to people around the Americas who want to expand what God is doing on the earth in these last days. One avenue to accomplish this was to put together a board of some of the most forward-thinking pastors, leaders, and visionaries from all over the world. These frontline workers would be able to become part of this larger body of believers. All this was done as a way to carry the message of the Bible and a Savior to a world that is hurting before Christ returns again. The Board of Church Growth International of the Americas is made up of true visionaries with years of combined experience and knowledge in their respected areas. Dr. Bob Rogers is president of CGIA. Dr. Rogers has led the fasting movement in America, encouraging churches throughout the Americas to emphasize prayer and fasting. Evangel World Prayer Center has nine locations with an average attendance of 7,300 persons. Dr. Rogers is president of Word Broadcasting Network in Louisville, Kentucky. He's a board member of Church Growth International, Seoul, South Korea.
Chuck Brewster, Executive Director. Chuck Brewster founded Champions of Honor in January 2005. This ministry is focused upon men and their relationship with God, their families, their church, and their community. Chuck also consults on church security issues and has formed a company, Church Security Insights. Prior to coming to ministry in 1998, Chuck served 23 years as a special agent with the United States Secret Service. Pastor Cleddy Keith is the senior pastor of Heritage Fellowship in Florence, Kentucky. Pastor Cleddy has been a man consumed with a passion for revival. As a Teen Challenge director in Houston, Texas, he ministered to down and outers and drug addicts hooked on drugs of the 60s. For the past 23 years, recognized as an apostolic figure, he has been a frequent guest speaker at national and international conferences in the USA and many nations around the world. The purpose of Church Growth International of the Americas is to help bring church growth through the power of the Holy Spirit to North, Central, and South America. CGIA of the Americas is not a denomination or just another organization. It is a fellowship with a mission to evangelize our cities and nations with the supernatural power of God. To do this, we must unite in fellowship with like-minded believers and leaders. Our goal is to unite on common ground not to emphasize our differences. This fellowship is based on the power of the Holy Spirit and His supernatural leading. We recognize the spiritual principle that one can chase a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. CGIA of the Americas will provide fellowship, but our mission and purpose is to strengthen and strategize as a body. Let's take a look at the subject of sanctification. Uh, sanctification is one of those words that you don't hear a lot, but yet it's found all through the New Testament for sure and throughout the Bible. And I'd like to take a few moments and talk about sanctification because this is something that uh, is viewed differently among various groups and denominations. And I just want to share with you the perspective uh, that we have regarding sanctification and of course you'll be at liberty to search the scriptures to see how you discover sanctification in your own life. I want to read this passage and again this uh, passage is from P.C. Nelson but listen very carefully because this is going to uh, provide a backdrop to understand sanctification as I'm going to share it with you in this lesson. The writer says, if regeneration has to do with our nature, justification with our standing, and adoption with our position, then sanctification has to do with our character and our conduct. Now let me pause here to simply say in this quotation, we're talking about spiritual matters, we're talking about our relationship with God, and so it's talking about regeneration changes who we are in our nature, justification, in other words, the price has been paid, has given us right standing with God, our adoption has put us in that position of being in Christ, then sanctification has to do with character and conduct in the believer. So let's go on. In justification, we are declared righteous in order that in sanctification, we may become righteous. So righteous to become righteous. Justification is what God does for us, while sanctification is what God does in us. Justification puts us into a right relationship with God, while sanctification exhibits the fruit of that relationship, a life separated from a sinful world and dedicated to God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should obtain from, uh, excuse me, abstain from fornication. Boy, words are important, aren't they? Abstain from fornication. In sanctification, we are to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and at the same time, perfect holiness in the fear of God. That comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. I'll read it straight from the scripture in the New King James. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
In other words, sanctification for many years was, was considered to be a dress code or the way a person cut their hair. But really, sanctification is so much more. Now, there is certainly nothing wrong with modesty. There is nothing wrong with uh, actually dressing and living and acting in a way that, that you believe will please the Lord. When I was growing up, preachers used to preach, uh, don't you go anywhere that Jesus can't go with you. Don't say anything that Jesus can't hear you say. Don't do anything that you can't do in front of Jesus. And then you ask you the question, if you go to this place and the Lord were to return, would you go to heaven? And I mean, there was, it, it was a strong conviction. And while some of that leaned on legalism, at the same time, you know what? We could use some more of that today. There needs to be an emphasis on sanctification because sanctification is twofold. It means that we are set apart unto God. And it means that we are separated from the world. And that's probably the one that people have the most difficulty with, is that one about being separated from the world. Second Peter, uh, let me look at the scripture here real quick, because I want to get it right. Let me see if I have it jotted down in my notes here. I believe I do here a little bit later. But let's look at it anyway. I want to go to it right now. It's, it's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To me, that is the picture of sanctification, along with some of these other scriptures that I've read and will read. It's that we are called and set apart for God's special purpose, for God's special plan, something that He's designed for us. I shared the scripture in an earlier lesson from Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil to give to you a future in the hope. It's that same concept. The enemy, Satan, wants to make people, wants you and the people that you teach to think that God has motives toward them that are either difficult or not for their benefit or are outdated. And, and because of that, cause people to reject it. Well, just like Eve had that doubt that rose up and had that question, well, we could ask these same things regarding sanctification. Because we're living in an age when people are just kind of checking things off and ruling them out and saying, well, that's, that's not important. But what is important is to realize that we are separated unto God, called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. And so we are called to be sanctified, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about being sanctified. And let me just say this, it's not enough to be separated from evil. The person uh, or thing being separate, or sanctified must be devoted to the use and service of God. In other words, if a person is just trying to put on the airs of being holy, but it really has nothing to do with their relationship with God. That's all in vain. But what we're talking about is being set apart unto God and separated so that we might walk uprightly before Him. One aspect of sanctification is a, it's an instantaneous work. And this is where a lot of the debate concerning sanctification comes in. People th there, there are those that believe that when a person gets saved and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, they're sanctified. In other words, there is a work of the Holy Spirit of God in their life that transforms them once and for all. And to that I would say, yes, amen, that's a great thing, but I don't think it stops there. There is an aspect of the instantaneous work of sanctification. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 and 14, it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord by the Spirit of our God. We are, it says, no, that was from 1 Corinthians 6.11. That's 1 Corinthians 6.11. It 
now from Hebrews 10 and verse 14. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are being sanctified. In other words, he made a way. You know, when you read through the scriptures, in the New Testament, the term for Christians and for believers is saints, or called saints. Now, I know there are some Christian groups and church groups that have a whole different concept about what a saint is. But in the New Testament reading of the epistles and so forth, Christians are referred to as saints because they are sanctified. They are set apart unto God and for His purpose. And so it was a distinction of holiness, yes, but it wasn't just someone that had a certain age or lived a certain length of life or had a certain amount of experience. It was someone washed in the blood and set apart unto Jesus because an instantaneous work had taken place when their sins were forgiven. However, it's also important to remember that sanctification is also a progressive work. It's a progressive work. And it's a work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we go through life, we'll experience things and go through processes as the Lord leads us and guides us. And He directs us that will cause us to grow in Him. Peter said this in 2 Peter 3.18. He exhorts us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, we have a very illuminating text showing us how Christ operates in us through the Holy Spirit to transform us by the degrees into His own glorious image. P.C. Nelson points us directly to this passage, and I want to share it with you so that we can read it and see it in the Scripture for ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. There's that word, transformed. Transformed is a great part of the progressive sanctification that takes place. Into the same image from glory to glory, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who will also do it. In other words, that's the fullness of salvation that we talked about. But as we think of sanctification and set apart unto God, there's that progression. It would put you in the same mind of what I referred to early, in our earlier lesson of salvation about being saved. They're parallel concepts of how Christ is working in us. The Holy Spirit's working in us. And then it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. He sanctifies us. Remember, Jesus prayed in John 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we have the work of the Father and the Spirit, and we have the work of the Word, the truth of God, that sanctifies us, and we are purified in our hearts by faith, according to Acts 15, 19. Another point I want to share with you concerning sanctification is this. We have to cooperate to be sanctified. We have to cooperate to be sanctified. Let me just share this scripture with you. 1 John 3, 2 and 3, it sums it up. John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we're not there yet, but we're headed that way. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that has hope has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. Of course, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Mark, be holy as I am holy. And boy, that's an incredibly high standard, and usually we don't even think that's possible to attain, but it certainly is a goal that we're to strive for. We're, we're made perfect through the blood of Jesus, but then we live it out and walk it out so that we might grow close to him and be sanctified. And so... Sanctification 
is extremely important. It's not something that's designed to create pride or arrogance in us as living a holy life, but it's something where we allow God to work in us so that we can grow closer to Him and be conformed, transformed into His image and likeness, as we talked about earlier, by the working of the Holy Spirit in us. So it's a wonderful blessing. And that should be our goal and our desire, to be set apart unto God and separated from the world. Not, not in such a way that we can't evangelize or reach the lost, but that we don't allow ourselves to be conformed to the world according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And let me close with this verse, these two verses rather. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. That is sanctification.